Hello, everyone. There we go. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and start going through this, uh, this discussion on search engine optimization now because I know that there's going to be a ton of questions and I want to make sure that everybody leaves here with something that they may have heard or have thought was true that they're not sure about and at least they can get an answer from a pretty credible source. Um, search engine optimization is something that I've been doing now for about eight years. When I started it, it was like, why would you optimize for Google? They're nobody. Back then it was Excite and Lycos and all those kind of players. And the reason why I love this, uh, actually interacting with an audience like yourselves, is because search is full of a lot of people that claim they really know what's going on, and they lead a lot of you down paths that were totally wrong. And then you come along and you meet someone that might know what they're talking about and say, well, that's not what I was told three or four months ago. So this presentation is geared to you firing questions at me. Um, I've been doing this long enough to where I'm usually pretty comfortable answering about 80 to 90 percent of your questions on the fly. Any ones that I can't answer, I will try to when I get back home and do a little research, see if I can get you a real answer. Um, so by all means, when something comes up that you have a question about, please raise your hand and we will get that, uh, we'll try to get that question answered if we can. The only thing that I ask is that uh, when I answer one of your inquiries, that you kind of take it at face value. Uh, this isn't an opportunity for us to have a total back and forth. Uh, if you want to talk about it a little bit later, that's fine. But just to make sure that everyone here can get some of their questions answered, I'd prefer it if you pose the question, I'll give back my thoughts on it, and, uh, and then we can move on to others. First, if you're sitting in the proximity of or are sitting on one of the yellow cards, could you number down the right-hand side, one through eight for me, please? They're kind of scattered throughout. All right. And how do I sound out there? I'm assuming I'm okay? Great. That's the right hand side. Doesn't matter which one you want. I think the, the biggest farce about search, and it's what I hate the most about being involved in this industry, is the SEO myth, which is every site ranks well for something. And people will tout that as a great ranking. I once had someone tell me they didn't need my services because they already ranked number one for the word New York. I said, wow, that's tough. I've been involved in this space for a while, and New York is a tough one. I typed it in. I didn't find them. I said, well, where are, where are you guys? Oh, well, if you type in New York as one word, we're number one. Where your domain's newyork.com. Like, what did you think was going to happen? It's really not that hard. So, you know, it's things like that that I've come across in the eight years that I've been involved in search where it has prompted me to make sure that, to the best of my ability, I can educate folks that are, you know, trying to figure this whole thing out. It's a lot to learn. Uh, and educate you guys so that you walk out of this room saying that you learn something, pick something up, or even better, you can keep your SEO, you know, team, you know, a little more accountable. Because a lot of times you don't know whether or not these things are really as hard as they say or not. So that's what we're going to go through today. And like I said, as things come up, please raise your hand and we'll get to you. So we're going to talk about time wasters. There are things that I'm still asked about today that I'm like, I haven't done in four or five years, which just goes to show that with all the information out there, people still are trying to figure out this whole search thing. Um, one of the most important things is developing a cert architecture. Uh, I'll get into what that means. Selecting keywords to me is hands down the area where most people are weakest, so I wanted to also touch that. Uh, linking, and why well, you should use Firefox when you work on linking, I will show that as well. And I'm going to give you all live examples. Uh, theory is kind of a waste at this point. Let's really get down to brass tacks and so I can show you some of these tools. And uh, you know, the whole do, it, do I want to do this myself or do I want to outsource, I will give my best attempt at giving an unbiased view on that. Um, and you know, these rules change a lot. And what I've always done for this is my third time I've been here at the Affiliate Summit speaking about search. And if you just bring your business card and put it anywhere up here, I will send you every bookmark that I've aggregated for the last five years about search. Um, I am here to educate you so that you can use or have at your disposal the same tools that I use every day. Um, they're free. Almost every tool that we use is free. So a lot of what's out there on search, it's, it's a myth. Um, when someone says they've, had, they've developed a proprietary tool, they haven't, okay? There's only one way to rank well in search engine, and it's to stay on top of the industry like a madman. All right, these are techniques I have not used in at least four years, maybe even six. Image alt tags, have any of you heard, oh, well, let's put your keyword in the image alt tag and that'll help you rank well. No, it's not. Uh, the keywords meta tag, haven't done one of those in three to four years either. 
Um, keyword density analysis, this is one of my favorites. I haven't done keyword density analysis since like 2001 um, because back then you would actually develop an individual page for each search engine. As crazy as that might sound, you would develop a page for Excite and you knew that Excite wanted, you know, the terms mentioned 2.6% of the time to 3.2 and then you fell out of the range. Well, all those kinds of things have changed and it's one of those myths that's still out there that's an absolute waste of time. Optimizing your site for one word terms might be great for traffic, you're surely not gonna get a whole lot of conversions, and I think that's what we're all here to discuss. And submitting a website. Don't submit. I have not submitted a website since I can remember. The technology is good enough that if you actually develop a website that's actually worth people visiting and going to, that they're actually gonna link to it, and then the search engines are gonna find you on their own. There was even a time when, and we still don't know if Google's still doing it, they gave more of a boost to sites they found on their own because when you were submitting it, you're telling Google, hey, I want you to come check me out. So they're saying, ah, you're probably, you might be doing something that you really want us to find you versus us finding it naturally through the web on our own. So if you're using any of these five techniques, you might as well stop because none of them are really helping you. There's other things you can work on that will have much more of an impact. Of course, doing an image alt tag helps, but as some people will say, you know, there's 200 things that Google uses in its algorithm. I focus on like five to 10 of them, and I've done a decent job at this so far. So here are things and techniques that I do use. Developing a circular architecture. I will show you exactly what that means on the next slide. I do ridiculously intense keyword research. It's where we probably spend the majority of our time on a search campaign. Uh, when I have PR optimization, doesn't mean page rank. Talking about press releases. Uh, press release optimization is actually uh, a very, very nice thing to do. Are there any of the folks here from Pepper Jam? Anyone? There we go. Pepper Jam, who is upstate from us in PA, uh, they recently did a press release about um, a new blogging shopping engine that I think you all should check out. It's pretty neat. Um, but they did the press release, and it got picked up on biz.yahoo.com with a link over to Pepper Jam. You can't pay for that kind of link. You know, that's biz.yahoo.com, it's huge. And it came through them properly linking their press releases. Valuing links is another really big thing. You can go out and get 1,000 links and have them mean nothing, or you can go out and get 10 strong links and have them matter so much more than the 1,000. So it's about how you use your time. Research is easily, if you're doing this yourself, don't kid yourself in thinking that the techniques you used today are still gonna work six months from now. You literally have to stay on top of this industry regularly. It's, uh, it's a bit of a moving target, and it's what most people hate about search, but since I gravitate towards chaos, I absolutely love it. And the resurgence of the meta descriptions tag. For a long time, I'd say, ah, you know what, it's really not worth it. It's, uh, it's minor in its overall algorithm. But now what research is showing is that people just don't click on you because you're number one anymore. They're scanning everything that's above the fold, which is before they have to scroll. They're scanning all that, and then they're making a judgment on whether or not they're going to invest their, that one little click, on whether or not they're going to visit your site. Therefore, your meta description tag should be something that's more marketing-esque so that it catches someone's eye. If, you're, if you have a free shipping offer, put that in your meta description tag while you're doing the free shipping offer because as I'm scanning through and I see all these 10 companies that Google says offers you know, uh, a suit, if I see free shipping on one of them in the description, I'm more likely to click on it. You do it on pay-per-click, why would you not do it on, on the organic SEO side? Okay, so the first thing we're going to touch on is developing a search architecture. And what we mean is how you go about developing, how Google sees your site as a whole. And I'm going to jump out to a site now. Um, obviously, our site's a pretty good guinea pig. Um, if you notice, how many of you are familiar with PageRank, at least? We'll talk about it a little bit. Great, that's what I figured. We have a page rank of five on this page. But as you go through the site and click on different links, which better pick up. There we go. Uh, you'll notice that our page rank drops to four, which is typical. Your home page always gets the most precedent for what you're working on. And then all the pages that are linked from it, if they're linked properly, will also get a very significant portion. So for us, the way we developed our architecture from our home page is all of the most important pages are linked directly from the home page. And because we developed our navigation the way we did, every page you go on now has links back and forth to each one. So when you look at the example on the left, as you develop a hierarchy, if you can imagine, even if your site is totally search friendly, if you have a page rank of six on the home page, then it's a five on level one, 
more than likely, now this is, there's no absolutes in search. These things change, there's a lot of variables here. But for the sake of this conversation, if you have a page rank six on your home page, more than likely you're gonna get a five or a four on your next page, a three or a two on the next. So if you start to put your site's important pages deeper and deeper down to where they're not properly linked from other pages easily, you are hurting your own ability to, to rank well. So as you develop an architecture, the way we've always done it is more how it's done on the right-hand side, which is not only is the home page linked to each one of these main pages, but our navigation was developed so that the red level one also links to all the others plus the home. And the green level one links to all the others plus that one. So that's how we went about developing our architecture and that's how we consult with our clients every day on how to go about developing their architecture for search. Very often when people are developing websites, search is one of the last things they're thinking about. And then they call on someone like us or they try it themselves and they, figure, they can't figure out why it's not working. And very often it's because there's architectural issues with the way the site was developed. The best way to create more of a circular architecture are using dropdowns. Now, of course, if dropdowns don't work for you for a usability reason or something, that's fine. But from a search perspective, which is what we're here to discuss, dropdowns are hands down one of the better ways to go about creating a circular architecture. Now, there's a caveat with that. It's, there's only like two ways to develop uh, a dropdown so that you get the maximum impact from all the search engines seeing the text and the links that are in them. Usually, you're going to uh, make sure that any of the important text or links are not in JavaScript. Search engines don't read JavaScript. They haven't for a very long time. So if you have a JavaScript-based dropdown, Google doesn't see any of it. They don't see it. So therefore, all those links that, that it should see, it's not going to see. Okay? We uh, use dynamic HTML and CSS for a lot of our dropdowns. Uh, sitemaps. Sitemaps are critical because if properly implemented, they're on every page of your site. Okay, now let's think about how we go back to the architecture. Now you have a link on every page of your site that goes to a sitemap, which links out to every other important page. So all of your pages on your site are one page away from the sitemap. It's the, one of the easiest things you can do, other than redevelop your entire architecture, is put in a really strong, not overly optimized. Remember, the sitemap some people are gonna go to as a useful tool for themselves. Nothing I hate more than a site that's just butchered for search and not for users. Because if no one can use the site, I don't care how high you rank, they're just gonna hit the back button and go to the next person. So make sure that you keep that in mind as you're using some of these techniques. Always put your brand and conversions and what's best for your users above search, always. There should never be a compromise. Other things like useful links in a section are also very helpful. If there's other popular products, you might wanna list along with that. As long as the keywords are in the product name, it's also wise to link those over to other pages as well. And I have seen folks spend years trying to optimize their own site and we sat down with them and within five minutes, I'm like, well, this is the reason why you haven't gotten anything. And it usually has to do with their architecture or the implementation of their website, which we are about to get into right now. One of the biggest issues that I found that people, I, I can't believe development companies still develop sites like this. Are any of you in the middle of having a site developed? Okay, anyone that's in the middle of having a site developed, listen up to this very closely and do not pay that final check without the team at least taking a look at this. Because if you ever wanna optimize your site, you will be absolutely screwed and then you're gonna to have to go and get everything redone. Who wants to pay twice for work that your team may have, should have already known? So let's go out to some of my favorite sites. And I think you kinda of get what I'm into in a little bit. All right, let's go to Bluefly. My internet's so slow. All right, of course, you know, it's been fast all day. And now, Blue Fly, when it finished loading, I think has about a page rank of six or seven. And do you all see where the page rank is right here? I'm kind of rolling my mouse over it. Good, all right, it's still loading. And when it completes, it's like a six or a seven. The problem is every single link from here uses like a lot of question marks. Have you ever seen those URLs with a lot of question marks and equal signs and ampersands? Search engines hate that. They've always hated it, and there's easy ways around it during the development process that will keep that from being an issue. And Bluefly has not finished loading for some odd reason. But their homepage is like a six. Every link, see how this link up top here has department JSP question mark folder percent sign? The search engines hate that. And it, to the point where this page, when it's done loading, will have a page rank of zero, even though it's linked directly from a homepage that has a page rank of six, okay? So what that means is if your URLs are structured in that way, good luck trying to get your site to rank well for competitive terms. Maybe for very uncompetitive terms, you might be okay. But for very competitive terms, that will kill you. 
their page rank for this page is a two. Notice on our site, where we didn't have all the gobbledygook at the end, our homepage was a five, and all of our other, all of our other pages were fours. This page was linked directly from their homepage, and it went from a six down to a two. Let me give you another example. Assuming that this thing loads pretty fast. How many of you have those kind of sites where you're like, uh-oh, is that us? Yeah, you're not going to raise your hands, I know. <laughs> but if, if you're in the middle of developing a site, I cannot tell you enough. Now's the time to tell your team, look, there's two things that are not in my bookmark. So if you have a site like that, you may want to write this down. There's two very techy things that you don't need to know other than to tell them they need to implement it. If you are on a Linux or Unix-based platform and your sites are on that platform, they have to use something called Mod Rewrite. It's a small little plug and they can drop in and get rid of all that stuff so that your site's then search friendly. That's one. If you're on a Windows-based environment or IIS environment, it's something called the IS API Rewrite Module. It lets you rewrite all those URLs so Google also thinks they're all static instead of dynamic. So many of you have probably heard that Google doesn't like dynamic pages. It's true. So what you have to do is make your pages look like they're static. It's not a trick. Everybody does it. Amazon, who I worked for for a while, does it. Barnes & Noble, who I worked for for a while, doesn't. How many times have you done a search for a random product and Amazon showing up in the top 10? A lot, right? How many of you have seen some kind of Amazon link somewhere there? How many of you have seen a Barnes & Noble link up there, other than when you're searching for Barnes & Noble? There's a reason for that, and it's because Amazon, from the beginning, developed their architecture to where all their URLs are formatted that way. Barnes & Noble didn't, and it takes so much effort to go back and redo it that they're missing out on traffic and sales every day because of one small thing. So if you're in the middle of getting a site developed or if you are about to get one developed, that's something that if search engines matter to you, your team should know about and should know how to implement. Yes, we have a question. Here's why. Uh, usually for us, we'll charge somebody five grand to do a search architecture audit, okay? We wouldn't need to do that architecture audit if your team had it built it right from the first place. And then, now somebody's got to go back and fix it. You've already paid that last check. They're like, oh, it's going to cost you this much for us to do this. Now they're learning on your dime for something they're going to apply to the rest of their customers. And you foot that, you footed that bill. I don't think it's fair. And if your team is like great pro at programming and not great at search, bring someone in, or now you know. You know, if you don't know the intricate details of this, bring someone in to sit down with them for five hours. Most of the teams that I've sat down with, they get this within five hours. We sit down with our tech team, their tech team, and they're like, oh, so that's all we gotta do? Yeah, that's all you gotta do, it's really simple. Let's see if a GovBerg watches site will load. Okay, homepage with this very slick looking guy. Hey, I'm buying a watch. Uh, he's buying a watch, and this site is a page rank of five. Great, right? Okay, so a company like this might just want to rank well for a word like Gucci watch. Maybe, you know, they sell them. They might want to rank well for that term, considering it's typed in tens of thousands of times a month. Notice where the page rank goes. And look at the URL when it loads. You know what, I'm not gonna wait for it to load. Uh, and it just moved, there we go. Now, notice they have one just one what we call a parameter. It's a question mark and something equals something. Many of your sites probably have long strings of those. Their page rank from a page directly linked from their homepage again went from a five to a zero. Google has said I assign no prominence to this page and it all has to do with their architecture. They're in the middle of developing a site right now and they chose to, or actually they just finished this site and they chose not to bring us on for like five hours worth of work and now they have no chance of ranking well for all the different brands as well as the different model numbers and by now I don't know how many of you are aware, but when people type in brand names and model numbers, they're ready to buy just that thing. So it doesn't make sense for you to rank well for the word Gucci, which you have on your homepage, but not Gucci Watch 05016X. Trust me, that guy wants that watch. So you better make sure that your site is architected and developed in a fashion that lets you easily rank well for those kinds of terms. Other things, um, important links in Flash and images, that kills us. You know, if you have a very important uh, text, but it's in a flash or it's in an image, the search engines aren't going to read that. Now, I've always had somebody say, search engines read flash. Yeah, they do. It's just like a big text file to them. There's no bolding. There's no this. There's no that. It, although they read it, it's not going to help you rank well if it does. 
if you have orphan or entry pages, they're also never going to rank well because they're not linked from your overall architecture. They're just sitting out there on the side. And that's okay. Your landing pages are usually prime examples of pages that are sitting off on the side that aren't linked from your architecture. That's fine because you're not trying to get them to rank well for anything. But the pages that you would like to get to rank well should be directly linked from your, your architecture. Redirected home pages. How many of you have heard of 301 versus 302? It's a simple rule. 301. That's it. There is no 301. There's a tool that I have in my tool set that will hit your site and tell you whether or not you have a 301 or a 302 redirect. Therefore, you run it. It's a free tool. It's in my bookmarks, which I'm giving out to anybody that gives me their card. And you have it. So then you'll know whether or not it's unfriendly. And then you just need to go back to your programming team and tell them, hey, you need to make that a 301. They should be able to do it. Yes, question? How do you classify the difference Good question. And you know what? It's very technical, and I don't know, but I know that when my clients have redirects and I run this tool, if it doesn't say 301, we can't even take their business on until they fix it. See, the thing is, for me, it's not knowing the intricate details of all this. It's knowing what's keeping me from achieving ridiculously high rankings for my clients. And if I know it's a 301 versus a 302, I'd have to bring my tech guy Joe up to explain it all, and you guys would all be asleep by then. But you should know that there's a tool that you can run on your site. If your site goes to your home page and then it has another thing, like it redirects the user to it, you should run this tool. If, you're, if your uh, redirect is JavaScript based, remember what I said before. Search engines don't read JavaScript. So therefore, they don't see that redirect. Okay? So these are the kind of things that literally, I've seen people fix like that and change the entire landscape of how they go about ranking. Question. Good question. It's been that way since I started search. They haven't changed it yet. And search is a, not a very forward-looking business. I mean, yeah, you can get into the forward-looking. My clients don't want to know what might help them rank well 12 months from now. They want to know what's going to help them rank now. So for right now, if you have important things in JavaScript, it's only if they're important. You need JavaScript. We use JavaScript on everything that we do. But we make sure that the most important parts of the site are not dumped into JavaScript because we know the search engines may not read them. There's a question there, too. Not as much. Not as much. And remember, there's no absolutes in search. One thing you all should realize, as someone that's done this for eight years, there's no absolutes. Google will make a liar out of a lot of people in my position if they say, there's 200 pieces of the Google algorithm. Yeah, there are. What, did you talk to Sergey Brin and Larry Page? I know they don't return my phone calls, and I've been working with them for eight years. So there's no, like, there's no hard and fast rules here. And be very, very fearful of someone that comes along and tells you that, well, this is how it has to be. I mean, there are some things I'm giving you today that really legitimately are that, but there's always another way. You know, there's usually another way around some of these things. Um, if something doesn't sound right, doesn't sit well in your gut, listen to your gut. I uh, tell you, shopping carts and content managers kill search engine optimization people. And there's a reason why. The people don't know how to develop them so that we can do what we do. Um, two things. If your shopping cart has a bunch of question marks and equal signs, your shopping cart is now not search engine maximized. Search engines may find the page, but they're not assigning all the prominence they could if you rewrote those URLs to put in slashes instead of having all those question mark and equal signs. Another great thing about doing URL rewriting, you can start to put the keywords in your URLs. Even if your content manager or your, or your, e, or your e-commerce tool kicks them out as some crazy numbers, you can say whatever you see that number, rewrite it and instead call it suits. Or instead of going to the Gucci directory, which in your CMS might be slash number 20, now you say anywhere you see slash number 20, call it Gucci watches. Why? Because that's an important piece of how Google uh, goes about ranking websites. And there is a difference between search friendly and search optimized. Um, saying that the search engines can get to a page is very different than saying that page can be tweaked so it maximizes the visibility. That's a huge difference. I recently worked with a content management company and they said, oh, our, 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 our CMS is search friendly. And it was. The problem is that it automatically generated your title tags. So if you wanted to go in and change your title tag, which hands down is the most important thing you can change on your website, is the title tag. 
it's automatically developed by a, by, a, by a tool that puts in the name of your company first. You're already ranked well for the name of your company. The name of your company should go at the end of your title tag if you have to have it there, because there's those kind of brand managers that are like, well, we have to have the name Mercedes somewhere. Well, then put it at the end, because you're gonna rank well for Mercedes without trying. If you're trying to rank well for the word luxury cars, you have to put that first. And if your CMS automatically generates your title tags, then that CMS has to be rewritten. So those are some of the things you may want to look for as you are working on or working with developers on sites. And let me see how I'm doing for time here. Good. Linking. Linking is always the big thing. I'm going to get through this pretty quickly. Um, if you develop something worth linking to, people will link to it. It's really that simple. If you develop something that's of value to people on the web, people will link to it. Okay. Things like calculators, free trials, articles, etc. Um, I also mentioned spreading yourself somewhat thin on links. What I mean by that is don't go out there and spend $1,000 a month for a link on one website. Because that website gets banned or something happens in it with Google or they pull it or they do some kind of crazy programming technique. Like how many of you may not have even known? You may have bought links on websites with all those question marks and equals in their URLs. We don't buy links from websites where the page where our link is going to be on has a bunch of question marks and equals. Why? Because we know Google's not going to assign the highest level of prominence to that link. So therefore, it lowers the value of it, and I'll be damned if I pay $1,000 for that. So these are the kind of things, hopefully, and hopefully it's starting to all kind of come together, where even when you're going out and getting links, the people that have all those question marks and equals in their URLs, they're not getting the maximum that they could for your link and for your dollar. It's one of the criteria that we use when we go out and get links for our clients. We do not submit our client sites to websites that have question marks and equals in the URL. Okay. Another thing to, to consider is how many links are on the page. Page rank, which is you know, still important, uh, it's not totally out and gone, it gets divided up by the number of external links on that page. So me personally, I'd rather take a link on a page with a page rank of three that has 10 links than a page that has a page rank of eight with 300. Just do the division. All those, each person now just gets a small little piece. All 300 people get a small piece of that 800 passed on to their website versus only competing with 10 people who all get a piece of the, the page rank of three. One of the things that I like to do, oh, let me go back to something. This is one of these like shady techniques, so you should be cognizant of it. People will often charge you money for links and use a robots.txt or what's called a nofollow tag. And the nofollow tag kind of came about when people started spamming blogs with their comments. I don't know if any of you have seen that, where somebody posts a comment that's just like, hey, Rolex watches. You're like, the article was about uh, you know, uh, women's clothes. So you know, people used to do that, and as a result, you can put something on your URLs that keep those links from being spidered. Where this hurts you most is if you're doing reciprocal linking. Because I might give you a link on a page that Google never sees, because I put the nofollow tags on all my links, and you just linked to me, and I got, all that, I got all that power from your link, and I gave you nothing. Although you see it there, from a Google or a MSN or Yahoo standpoint, that link means absolutely nothing. Okay, it's something else you should be cognizant of. And people that link to you, this is one of the easiest things. Run a check and see who's linking to you. And a lot of times they'll link to your site with like, hey, it's http www.thinkseer.com. I'm like, yeah, would you mind changing that link from thinkseer.com to say, Seer Interactive SEO Professional? Oh, yeah, sure, yeah. You know, thanks for using my article. I'm glad you liked it. Now I have a link with the text that matters because I'm not trying to rank well for the word www.thinkseer.com. I already do. Okay, it's something to consider. And using a page rank search, this is a very nice tool that I'm gonna show you, assuming that this internet works with me well today. Uh, what you do, let me find, let me just Google it. Google page rank search. Great, SEO chat, this tool here, it's in my bookmarks. If you come up and give me your card, you don't need to write it down. Um, there's a lot of things here that I'm gonna show you. This tool, when it loads, will actually show you the page rank along with the, the listings. So you can do a link colon competitor name, sort it by the page rank, and now you see all the highest page rank sites that are linking to your competition. It's the savviest way to get high power links from your competitors. So let's give this a shot. Uh, let's use one of my favorites. So SEO consultants is a word that I would love to rank well for. And we're down at like number four. Yeah, we're down at number four, but I sure would like to be number one. So let's take uh, SEO consultants directory. And I mean, their URL is SEO consultants, so 
I might as well be prepared to be at number two for a very, very long time, no matter how hard I try. And I'm going to use a tool, and this one is also mentioned in my links. Watch when I right click. I'm going to go down to this little thing called SE Open. It's a Firefox plugin. This is why earlier I mentioned you want to use Firefox. I can easily go to Google and say, show me Google's backlinks. I don't have to remember the syntax and type all these things in to try to figure it out. And there it is. So now, this shows me everybody that's linking to Google, or, or to SEO consultants. What it's not showing me is how valuable these individual pages are. So I'll take this syntax, drop it into the page rank search. I'm going to order by page rank and say, go get it. And it's going to come back with all, in order of page rank. So if I was competing with them, I might go to CSS Border Design Challenge. I wouldn't in this case because they're not going to give me a link. But this is an idea for your competitors and how you can go out and find the sites that are providing the most powerful links to them. And those are the guys you want to go and say, hey, I noticed you did a review on these guys and you didn't do one on like a counter one on ours. Would you mind? You might get a yes, you might get a link, and you might get the most powerful links. So instead of just going out there randomly getting links, some of them which may not have those URL strings with a bunch of stuff in it, this is the kind of strategies that we use. I'm giving you the exact things that we do on a daily basis to work for our clients. Can, can you do a search one, two, three, four, just in Google one more time? All right, I did a search on Google, and there's a tool called SE Open for Firefox, and that's what I used, but the syntax is typically what you see right here. Link, colon, HTTP, www, and your competitor's URL. You take that and put it into the page rank search, which I did there. You see it right here. And I said order by page rank and click search. And that's how it's come back with all of these different sites ordered by page rank, and it shows me the page rank right next to them. What does this help me do? It keeps me from having to click on each one of those, go out to their site, see what their page rank is. That's a waste of time. And I need to work as efficiently as possible. And many of these Firefox plugins will help you work much more efficiently. Okay. I showed you the, the tool. I want to get through a few other things, so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Keyword development. We all stink at it. You know why? Because we're biased by our own search behavior. I've sat down with more people that are like, well, I don't search that way. I pack up my bag and I leave. Because unless you buy your own product every single day and that's how you stay in business, you need to make sure that your keywords resonate with the people that are typing things in. Don't look at your top 10 keywords report in your, uh, in your web analysis tool because those are terms you're already ranking well for, duh. So therefore you type them in, you're like, oh, we're doing great. We're ranking well for all these terms. Well, that's because people are already finding you on those terms. You never know the terms that people might be typing in that you're not ranking well for because you're ob they're obviously not getting to your site from them. So the best search engine optimization people, in my opinion, are people that can take their own search behavior, ball it up, throw it out the window. Take your own bias and get rid of it. Because if you bias your own search on how you would search, you're only going to rank well for the terms that you would, yourself would find. And the closer you are to the product, the more likely you are to use things like acronyms, jargon, things that no one else knows but you and people in your industry. Now, if you're only selling to people in your industry, that's great. If you're not, then you need to call it what the man on the street calls it, or don't target those terms. I'll give you an example. We're working with a, uh, with a company. They do used office furniture. Okay, They are like, well, for branding purposes, we want to rank well for the word used office furniture. But from a branding perspective, we want to call it pre-owned everywhere on the site. Pack up the bag. See ya. You know why? Because people don't type in pre-owned office furniture. And we showed this to them. But yet, because they're brand, it's like, you have a great brand. Nobody's coming to your site. I thought you stayed in business that way by selling things to people that came to your site. So, you know, it's one of those things where you do need to balance brand versus what's good for search. You know, and this is one of those cases where it didn't make sense. They had to stick with what was best for their brand. I understand that. But I, I can't get your site to rank well if you're not willing to make certain changes. Don't think you're going to be able to trick Google or something like that, and I'm going to be able to get you ranked for some whiz-bang technique. It's not the case. You literally need to make changes to your site. But all isn't lost. Um, you know, if you use tools, and how many of you have used the Overture Keyword Suggestion tool? Great. It's also bad. There's a lot of flaws inherent with the Overture Keyword Suggestion tool. Does anybody know any of the flaws? You got it. One of the things they do is broad match, if you didn't hear that. And what that means is the singulars and plurals, 
there could be a big difference between who searches on them. They lump them together into one number. So if you target a singular, but most people type the plural, the overture tool will not teach you which one's the right one to target, okay? Overture says, ah, oh, those misspellings, ah, we're gonna lump them in, we know what they really meant. So now you're not gonna find a decent amount of misspellings for keywords that people might type in, because Overture just lumps them all together because they know what you're really looking for. You wanna do what I call starting wide, which is don't bias your results. If you are Prilosec and you sell a heartburn medication, don't start your keyword research on heartburn medication. Start it with heartburn, and you'll see that people are more likely to type in heartburn drugs than heartburn medication. You'll see that they're looking for heartburn symptoms. Uh, you know, you probably find some online Canadian pharmacy, heartburn drugs, whatever. But if you start wide, you're not gonna bias your own results. If you start very narrow and say, oh, we, we, we do heartburn drugs, and you type in heartburn drugs into these kind of tools, that's what you're gonna get back. And always remember that people search for solutions to problems and not the other way around. <laughs> so there are some technical elements here that I wanna go through. These are all tools that are in my uh, bookmark, so you do not need to write them all down. The first thing I wanna do, I've already given you the bad news. So before we get there, I wanna show you a couple of tools. And actually, I'm gonna skip ahead a bit to get to where we were talking about singulars versus plurals. How many of you have heard of Google Trends? Great, how many of you have actually used it? Great, because you can do things to help you figure out should you use a singular or a plural. And here's an example. Let's look at accounting jobs versus accounting jobs. More than likely, they're gonna be the same, but they're not here. How many of you would have guessed that, oh, well, it's one or the other? You would say, oh, we're gonna go for one or the other, because you know what? The overture tool would have given you the singular. Here, you'll notice that more people type in the plural, okay? That's one of the areas where the overture tool absolutely stinks. And it's not a bad tool, but if you know the flaws inherent in the tool, which I'm trying to give you all today, now you know to look in other places before you make a conclusion based on those tools. So remember when I had you all write down one through eight on your, on your yellow index cards. How many of you have the yellow index card? Raise your hand just so I know where you are. Perfect. Would you do me a favor? We're gonna go through this really quick. Would you write down the words you would type in to find this product? And we're going to go through these really quick, so start right. What would you type in to find this product? What would you type in to find this product? And because I love these things, because I won't bias your results, what would you type in to find this thing? And most of you are probably writing pretty much the same thing. But there's always some people that don't. And they might actually be willing to purchase from you if they could find you. And you had the right keywords in your site so that you were found. But let's make it get a little more complex. What would you type to find a company to set up your phone office system for your office with multiple extensions? What would you type in to find that? I think some of you guys are starting to see where I'm getting with this, right? And when everybody stands up with their cards and says what they typed in, you're gonna see that people will all look for the same product or service and every one of them might call it something different. And they may all be willing to purchase from you if you did the keyword research to find out that they're all typing in all these different derivatives. We're actually working with a company that works on infertility. What would you type in to find a company or individual that could help you with infertility problems? What would you type in? You'd be amazed what you might find. I'll tell you, when you do keyword research, sometimes you find some really sick things. You're like, wow, people really type that in. If you ever do any work for Disney, you would be amazed at some of the people that are probably hanging out on MySpace a bit too long. Okay, and what would you type in to find an organization like mine? If you're looking for somebody to get you at the top of Google, what would you type into a search engine to find them? All right, now take your yellow card and hand it to the person to your left. And if there's nobody to your left, hand it to the person to your right, okay? Can someone with that card stand up and tell me what your person had for this product. Someone? So maybe come through the audience because I'll start picking out. We got one right there. TV. So the first one was TV. Anybody have anything other than TV? Look how many hands are up. I have only a few cards. What do you have? Widescreen TV. Widescreen TV? Flat, flat screen. Okay, so we have TV and flat screen. Anybody doesn't have those, put your hands down. Anybody else with others? There we go. Plasma TV. We got a plasma. If you're plasma, put your hand down. TV entertainment system. She's ready to buy a plasma TV, but she's calling it. A, but you know what? The, the thing there that I'm trying to illustrate to you all is that 
You have to call it what people are calling it. You know, you might want to call it a plasma TV all day because it's a plasma TV. Well, why don't you do compare our plasma TV to LCD TVs? Now you have both keywords on the page. You're providing a comparison to the two, which is valuable to people, which people might link to if it's done really well. And now you've got both keywords up there. Because you're like, well, it's a plasma TV. Well, I can't call it an LCD TV. OK. Of course you can't call it an LCD TV when it's a plasma, but there's ways around that. OK. Let's go to this one. All right, somebody start. We got you again. Rio. Her name is Rio and she dances in the, no, not that one? Okay, so I mean, you might come back with lyrics. If you typed in Rio, you may just come back with lyrics. Next. MP3 player. Great. Anything different? I knew it. There's always an iPod on that one. It's not an iPod, but that's what people call it. You tell grandma you want an MP3 player, she's going to buy you an iPod. This. This should be somewhat easy, but let's see. Start again, my friend. Laptop. laptop. Anybody, anything other than laptop? Jeez. What do we got? Notebook. Computer. Laptop. laptop. Laptop computer. Important. If you just put laptop up in your title tag and don't put the word computer along with it, guess what? You're not going to rank well for the word laptop computer. Okay? We got another one in the back. Notebook, Notebook computers. You guys are starting to see it. This. I love boxers. Now I can say it's a boxer, but what all did you say was for this term here? Dog. Dog. Anybody different than a dog? Boxer dog. Boxer dog. Anything other? Pet, wow. <laughs> Brindle boxer. Someone that really knows will call that exactly what it is. Some of us are out there calling it a pet. It's a brindle boxer. I didn't even know that. Now let's get really, really into, when you get to the services side, this whole thing goes nuts. What would you type in for these guys to find a company to put in your multi-phone system? Phone office system. Does everyone here have that? Didn't think so. Come on, give me a couple others. Phone service. Phone service. PBX. PBX. Good. Corporate phone system. Business, Business telephone system. Come on, you guys, this side of the room, give me a little love. What do you have? Multi line phone installer. <laughs> Multi extension phone system company. Now you'll notice. All these people are looking for the same freaking product. <laughs> so if you don't have all these different keywords and find a very creative way, and this is why when it comes to search, you can't be one of those companies, or you can't work with one of those companies that just stuffs a bunch of keywords in there. You have, it's, it's easy. Good search engine optimization people can not only achieve a high rank, they can do it without making your site look god awful and not make any sense. So it's one thing just to throw these keywords in, it's another thing to add some value. You have a question? The question is, how do I do this without a whole room full of people? And you know why? It's because since I've been doing this for eight years, I've learned to take my bias, ball it up, throw it out the window. I've learned to call my mom. Mom, I know you're 65, but what would you type in to find this? Because you know what? She buys things on Google or through Google that she finds. <laughs> but I think you guys are starting to get the idea. So let's skip to what you would type in to find a company like mine. Search engine? Helper. Did I get a search engine helper? <laughs> I, I, I got to change my cards. SEO. SEO expert. SEO expert. SEO consultant. SEO consultant. That's my favorite because we rank well for it. Google top rank. Google top rank. I once had someone tell me, ah, oh, your site stinks. You guys don't rank well for anything. I said, what do you mean? We're like number one or number two for SEO agencies. We're number five for SEO consultants. Well, I typed in top ranking company firm SEO. Well, dude, you're one. I did the keyword research and found, and I looked at the conversions for the keywords and found that we're not really targeting search engine optimization. We're targeting SEO. Does anybody have an idea why we're targeting SEO as our main term instead of search engine optimization? Ross, what do you think, bro? Because you got to know what SEO means. You have, you got it. We're looking for a more savvy consumer. You know why? Because we're not cheap. We're not the guys that are going to submit your site out to 100 search engines for 50 bucks. That's not us. We don't want the person that types in search engine optimization. You know why? They might be looking for tips, newsletters, tricks, and you know what? Unless you're here, you're not getting all my bookmarks. Okay? So, therefore, if you think about it, I don't want those people to come to my site. We might be able to say, yeah, we rank great for it, but I want to make sure our site attracts the right kind of people. Because you know what? I don't have that much time to sit there on the phone with someone that tells me that they want to rank well for a term for 500 bucks.
So therefore, I want to make sure I try my best to attract the more savvy audience. There's some new tools out there. Anybody know who these guys are? You know it. You, who is it? Thank you. These guys sucked, OK? <laughs> but I mean, where are they now? Donnie Wahlberg's lucky his brother's the one that actually became successful, even though he was Marky Mark. Oh, oh, awful. But we're not here to talk about those guys, are we? But they are tools, and I want to show you some new tools. So there's a double meaning there. Google Trends, which we skipped to, and I showed you the accounting job versus accounting job. I think that might have been somewhat eye-opening. But that's only one way to use this. I don't know if any of you have seen my article um, that I wrote about this a while back. So if you did, this is verbatim from it. Check your iPod or your MP3 Rio player, whatever, uh, for the next couple of minutes. But if you haven't, take a look at something. How you go about using your homepage real estate is a very important thing during different times of the season, potentially. And because I love watches, although I don't have one on today, I typed in tag Hoyer, Movado, and Omega watches. What you'll notice is that Omega is typed in so much more than all the others every month of the year. Come holiday season, Movado jumps from the stepchild to even sometimes higher than Omega. So what does that mean? What that means is come holiday time, you better make sure Omega and Movado get the same amount of play if you're looking between Omega, Movado, and Tag Heuer, you now know, leave Tag off on the side, but you better make some space for Movado if you can. If you want to optimize for that term, you better start six months out so that when the holiday season comes, you're ready. Another thing, just so that you're aware, because I'm not, I don't, this isn't in my bookmarks, is with Google Trends, you'll see over here to the right, we have United States in all years. You can actually do these searches by different countries and by different times. Make sure that you do your searches if your audience is US based, do them for the US because these people will skew your results like mad. What people in the UK type in, this is another thing that Google, uh, not Google Trends, Overture Keyword Tool doesn't tell you this. What people type in the UK sometimes is absolutely different than people in the United States versus other, other places. If you look at the bottom here, one of the neat things, it's giving me cities where this was most often typed in. This is a guess. This is not the kind of thing where you want to run out and open up a shop in Miami to sell you know, Movados. But it's giving you an idea of some of the regions where people may be typing in these terms. Competitive analysis, this is pretty easy. If you target some terms and you're doing PR and other things to build recognition for your brand, and the gap between you and your competitor stays the same, I don't know how well that PR worked for you. Now, is this going to tell you that it didn't work? No. Do not take a tool and run with it. But it may give you an indication that you might want to do a little more digging in the sense of what did that campaign actually do for you. How many of you have seen the commercial for Google, where it says Google Pontiac, instead of saying go to Pontiac.com, it says Google Pontiac? Good. I bet you that whoever came up with that idea told the firm, oh, this that worked great. It worked great. It didn't work great. You know why? Because my buddies at Google have showed me the way. If you look at the search trend for the word Pontiac in Google, how many times people search for the word Pontiac and compared it to Mazda? Pontiac, with their solstice, is trying to compete with Mazda's new Miata, OK? They're flat. They're flat. But there is a spike back in 2004. Anybody got an idea? If anybody answers this, I'll give you an hour on the phone of free consulting. Oprah. You got it. You got it. <laughs> Oprah. And you know how I figured that out? If you take Pontiac out, that's really good. See, you guys didn't think Oprah would come in handy. You guys, uh. Watch. When I put in Pontiac, notice how it puts these letters above that spike Letter A, if you look over to the right, Pontiac hopes Oprah giveaway will capture more attention for blah, blah, blah. Guess what? It did capture attention. But that whole Google Pontiac thing, nah, sorry. Didn't work. Their firm will tell them that that worked for here until, until the cows come home. It didn't work. You know what? Call Oprah again. She works. Because this isn't even a, a minor difference. You're talking about the di huge to little. So that's search trends. One quick thing, MSN has a new thing called Ad Lab. How many of you have heard of it? People that have heard of it, you guys are on top of this. This only came out about two weeks ago. And one of the best things it does, and pardon me if I start speeding up here, um, but there's a few things I want to get to. One of the things it does is if you type in BMW, and this is the example they give because their data set is not big. So right now, for most of your things that you're optimizing for, they're not going to have data on this yet. But what it does is their ad funnel will show you what people typed in before 
and what they typed in after they typed in your keyword. So now you're saying, well, the average person that typed in BMW, after making that search, they typically did a search for not Mercedes, for Mercedes. Obviously, this tool is truncating the plural, so it's not there. They search for Lexus, Audi, and Mercedes Benz, and then Honda was the next one. You can also do this for what they call incoming. So up here where you see direction, if you do it for incoming, it'll show you the five before someone typed in BMW. This is going to be a really nice tool once they get more data into it. Okay, there's something that we refer to as the search engine, over search engine optimized, highly ranking, but ugly site. This site here is one of those sites that, you know, now this is for, we typed in luxury items or luxury gifts, and this site came up. Doesn't make me feel very luxury. However, their, comp their competition that also ranks well has a site that looks like this and this. Very often what I've found is people get so into trying to rank well, they butcher their sites. Remember, these sites all came up in the top 10. It's only a back button away. Your competition, from a search perspective, is a back button away. So therefore, you need to invest in things like usability. You need to make sure that people recognize your name when they come to your site. Like, oh, I've heard of those guys before. That's where PR is going to help. Because if your site's just out there, and you're not investing in anything other than search, good luck. One of the things I've often said is if you build your site for humans, you don't have to worry about all these darn penalties that people talk about. Um, it, it, right now, the whole penalty thing is way over, way overplayed. I've seen case studies where things like security logos, um, purchase without login, or getting a white paper without login, go a long way in increasing conversions by up to 10, 11%. If I'm driving all this traffic to your site, then it's your responsibility to make sure that you have streamlined that process so that when people get there, they're, more like, they're most likely to convert. Good. I got two slides left, and I think I'm going to be able to get them in. The whole do-it-yourself versus outsource. Any of you that saw me speak last uh, six months ago at Vegas, you've seen this before, but I call it my toilet and taxes slide. I own a few properties and one day I decided I'm going to fix the toilet because I can Google the model and get the schematic and go to the store and fix it. I was on my back for three hours getting water dumped on my face when I could have been laying in my hammock to only have to call the plumber anyway and pay him to come and fix what I, what I wasted three hours on. I will never again try to fix a toilet. You know why? Because my best work is sitting here in front of this laptop. And for me, it's better to spend the money on having someone do it than for me to try to fix it, spend three hours on my back to be just more frustrated than when I started. And it's like doing your taxes. Every time I did my own taxes, it never turned out as good as when the accountant said, oh, did you realize you missed this, this, and this? I'm not going to do that again either. Um, you have to be ready to invest about 18 months. And that's pure honest. You have to be ready to invest about 18 months because you're going to have to test and tweak things that we already know works, which is okay. I think doing it yourself is a great way that even if it doesn't work, now you're empowered to help keep some of the people you're hiring honest because there's a lot of not honest people in this space. I always say go with your gut. Um, you know, if you don't feel something's right, don't go with it. Simple. I think opportunity cost is the biggest issue. Uh, you know, if it takes you 18 months to get up to speed on something that takes us six, well, what's that 12 months worth to you in terms of sales or leads? That's another thing. Obviously, your budget. You know, the only way to get a good, cheap SEO, this is how people got me for really cheap. I had just first started. If you can find someone that's got a lot of experience and just started, you're going to, you got yourself a gem. Because the people that are, oh, I've been in this space for a while, and we kind of dabble in it, nah, they're not too good usually. Um, software. The tools that I showed most of you today, they're all free. If you notice, I don't pay a dime for any of those. They're as available for me as they are available to you. There aren't many tools out there that really help in the search process, like PageCritic, okay. PageCritic. PageCritic is a software that if you downloaded, your, your com competition could download it, and if you plugged in the keywords, what it tells you to do is gonna be the same exact thing. So great, so if 10 of your competitors all downloaded the same software and use it, are you guys gonna take up the top 10? Are they gonna start tweaking and bumping you out? It's not always that easy, as just to buy a software and have it kick out some recommendations. The competitiveness of the landscape is critical. If you're not in a very competitive space, then you can get away with things like page critic, and by all means, use it. But if you find, when you're doing your keyword research, that there are terms out there that are being queried very often, and you know people are making money on them, they're calling professionals to do it. And the question is, you know, I've always said, keep your ego out of SEO. Don't pat yourself on the back because you got a number one for New York as one word. 
I'd rather be number 20 for New York as two words than number one for it as one. Because you need to analyze the traffic and the impact of that traffic. Rankings are just means to ends. So if they're not actually referring you business, you're wasting time. And some signs you might want to run from a search firm. If they cold called you, they're not really that busy. <laughs> and if they're good, they're busy. A required retainer is BS. Because once I get your site ranked in 12 or 18 months, you're going to continue to rank well for those terms usually for at least another 12 months without me touching the site. Because a lot of things we've done are not picked up by Google until after we're actually done your campaign. So you're going to keep going up after we're done. If someone says that they require a retainer to keep your rankings, I wouldn't trust them. Because what are they going to do? What if you're already ranked well? What, what more are they doing to collect that retainer every month? Not a whole lot. Now that you have some tools and you'll have the tools that are in my bookmarks, look up these query volumes yourself. If you go to a site called seobook.com, they have tons of tools up there that are available for free. And one of them is a great query research tool. Make sure that they're not telling you to rank well for keywords like black shoes in Alabama, because nobody's typing that in. So now you are empowered with tools like this to know nobody's typing that in. So what am I, if it costs you a 50 bucks to have somebody optimize the term black shoes in Alabama, you just wasted 50 bucks, because nobody's typing it in. Your common comebacks, if their site doesn't rank well for anything, are, oh, we're the shoemaker's children, you know? We, don't, we, we didn't have time to do our own SEO. Okay. They're busy working for their clients is another one. We're so busy working for our clients that we didn't have time to do our own. How can you tell me that search is worth it for me if you're not going to do it for your own site? And my favorite is, we like to stay under the radar. I like to stay on top of the radar. I'm trying to stay in business. So while they're staying under the radar, I'd be a little concerned about that, about that comeback. If they don't rank well for anything, that's a biggie. Um, if they don't proactively, don't ask them if they're going to analyze the traffic. Sit back and say, OK, well, what reports do I get? They say, oh, we'll give you a ranking report every month. Put on your shoes, find a new firm. You know why? Because you're not in this for rankings. Get your ego out of SEO. You're in this for business. Therefore, you want to make sure that they are tracking through your process how many people are adding to cart from search, how many people are completing the purchase, how many of them are returning, and what that value is to you. If they're just giving you a ranking report, it's not enough. Uh, if they're heavy on scare tactics, like, oh, well, you did this, you're going to get banned in Google. All right, that's a big thing these days, where, oh, you're going to get banned. Most of the time, it's going to be lifted. Uh, as long as you fix what you did, and you know what you did, <laughs> fix it, take it out, and then usually you'll come back, OK? The idea that it's all over is, uh, is like, at the end of the world is not necessarily the way to go. So. And anybody says they have proprietary software or they dabble in search, you got to eat this stuff for breakfast if you're going to be good at it. That's why I said you have to be willing to invest that amount of time. Speaking of time, I'm almost out. So are there any quick questions before I split? Yes. Yep. For keyword research, the tools we use most are Digital Point. These are in my bookmark. It's Digital Point, which gives you the top 10 for Word Tracker for free, which some of you might be paying for Word Tracker. It gives you the first 10 for free on Digital Point. I use Google Trends, I use Keyword Discovery, and uh, SEO Book are the main ones that I use for keyword research. Oh, yeah, just drop your card up here and you will all get my bookmarks. I usually do it on the flight home. Any others? Yes. I don't remove it. I just don't spend my time optimizing it because I know there's a thousand other things that I could work on that are going to have more impact than the words in the keyword meta tag. So that's why I don't really use it much. And one more in the back, and I think this might be the last one. Yes. A, a, a properly optimized circular architecture will not have a negative impact. Um, I mean, some of the brands we work with are pretty big, and we have to be very careful with the techniques that we use. If people are out there linking to you, you know, try to get them to link to the deeper pages on your site and not just to your home page, because that's one of the hardest things to get, is what we call deep links. OK? Any others? I probably have time for one more, and that's it. All right. Great. If you want my bookmarks, just drop my card up. I swear I won't email you after that. Thanks.